as we continue to make our way through uh, this first book of the Bible. And um, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull back the curtain just a little bit into what it is that we are about to do, the, the task of preaching, sitting under preaching. Uh, we, we have no hidden agendas here. We are very clear and plain about what we do and why we do it according to God's Word. And uh, in keeping with the theme of hermeneutics, as we uh, started a study this last Wednesday night on hermeneutics, the art and science of studying the Bible, how do we read and interpret the Bible well, I want us to think just a moment about something we talked about this last Wednesday night in that class. By the way, if you, if you missed the first class of, of Hermeneu, this hermeneutics class, uh, you're more than willing to join us or more than welcome to join us uh, this coming week. Even if you've missed some, we'd love for you to be there with us. But we talked about in reading the Word of God, there's a very simple task that we are ta- trying to achieve. First, what does the text say? Very plainly, what does the text say? What is the theology that we glean from the text? What, what, what do we learn about God? And then finally, how do we apply it to our lives? Uh, and, and so, spoiler alert, that is, uh, th- that is all we do with the preaching of the Word. We do the very same thing. There's nothing, nothing inherently fancy or, 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 or uh, clever about what happens here on Sunday mornings. We simply open the Word of God. We let the text speak. We pull out the theology of the text and we apply it to our lives. That's what preaching should be. That's what it should look like when we read the Word of God individually and in our homes and in our Sunday school classes, when we read the Word of God together corporately as a church. And so I want to make this very simple, very plain this morning. That is what we're going to do with Genesis chapter 21, verses 1 through 21. We're going to look at the text. What does the text say? We're going to glean some theology from the text, and then we're going to apply it to our lives. Again, nothing fancy, nothing hidden, no secret agenda here. We simply are going to let the Word of God speak to us this morning. And so I hope you found your way to Genesis chapter 21. Before we read the passage, though, I'd like us to pray together once again. So let's do that. Father, we come before you in your holy word in these moments, and Lord, we, we ask for your help. Uh, would you speak Uh, To us, Lord, from your word, as we know that you will and and you have promised. Lord, would you build up your church by your word alone. God, may everything we do and say in these moments be pleasing and acceptable before you. We commit this time to you. And it's in your son's holy name that we pray. Amen. Uh, We begin here in chapter 21 in verse 1. It says, The Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did to Sarah as he had promised. And Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age at the time of which God had spoken to him. Abraham called the name of his son who was born to him, whom Sarah bore him, Isaac. And Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old as God had commanded him. Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. And Sarah said, God has made laughter for me. Everyone who hears will laugh over me. And she said, Who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have, come, I have borne him a son in his old age. In these first seven verses of chapter 21, we see that it is at the appointed time that God fulfills his promises. This promise of Isaac that we have been told of all the way back in Genesis 12 did not come too soon or too late in the story. It came perfectly according to God's providential will just as it was supposed to here in chapter 21 in this season, in this moment. And these, these seven verses where the birth of Isaac is announced to us, there is a driving thrust that we primarily see in the first two verses that the word of the Lord is reliable. When God speaks, it is reliable. We can consider this to be true when we come before the Bible, the pages of Scripture, that when God speaks to us by his word, and he has We can trust it. It is true. It is reliable. And we see the reliability of his word just in the first two verses where three times the writer shows us that everything that happens here is just as the Lord had said it would happen. Verse 1, the Lord visited Sarah as he had said. Earlier in chapter 18, the Lord told Abraham and Sarah that he would come to them this time next year. And what would happen? She would have a son. And so the next part of verse 1 says, the Lord did to Sarah as he had promised. What was it that he had promised? Well, verse 2, she conceived and bore Abraham a son. 
This happens in his old age at the time, notice the third time, which God had spoken to him. God said that this was going to happen, and it did, because his word is reliable. Now, we we read these verses here, and so much of the story of Abraham has been this buildup and conflict over Isaac and his birth and the the trials that happen and the situations that happen in, in the difficulty of his birth in their old age and all of this. And we come to chapter 21, and and the announcement of the birth, and we might think to ourselves, there should be more here. It's just a few verses that announces to us Isaac's birth. It seems a little bit anticlimactic. Far more attention was given to the announcement of the birth. The story, the progression of the story of Abraham is is a gradual progression of revealing of information about Isaac's birth. Chapter 12, we're told that Abraham is going to have a great nation come from him. And then we're told that he's going to have a son and that he's going to be named Isaac. And Abraham is to circumcise him. All of these details are given to us. And yet, the announcement of the birth is just these few verses. And I believe that this is very intentional on behalf of the writer because, again, he wants to emphasize God's faithfulness, which we just sung about. There's not much to say here other than he's here because it was just as good as done when God announced it. When God said the child would come at this appointed time, it was set. So it should be no surprise to us that here we come and, and, and he's here. He's born just as God said he would be. Whatever the Lord says is clear. It is trustworthy. We can take it to the bank, if you will. It is reliable. There's something else here that's really important, and it's a verb. I hate to bore you with grammar, but there's a verb there in verse 1 that's really important. Verse 1, the Lord visited Sarah. This word is important because it's used in Scripture to speak of divine intervention that shapes or alters the destiny of an individual or a group of people. And this visitation from the Lord, this divine intervention on behalf of Sarah, not only will it shape the rest of her life and her destiny, but it shapes the people of God and their destiny throughout the ages to come. We are beneficiaries of the birth of Isaac this morning, the birth of the promised son. And so we see here primarily that the word of the Lord is reliable. But notice, too, how the two main characters here, Abraham and Sarah, respond to this divine intervention. First, notice that Abraham responds to the visit, to the divine intervention in obedience. Just as God had told him earlier in chapter 17, verse 19, to name his son Isaac, what does he do there in verse 3? Abraham called the name of his son who was born to him, whom Sarah bore him, Isaac. He names the son in obedience to the Lord Isaac, which, by the way, his name means son of laughter, which is a theme that comes to play again here in the story that we we come to this morning. Notice something else here. Three times the writer emphasizes in verses 3, 4, and 5 that this is Abraham's son, his own son that was promised to him earlier in the story. Verse 3, he called the name of his son. Verse 4, and Abraham circumcised his son. Verse 5, Abraham was 100 years old when his son, and notice that the name Isaac is attached three times to the words his son. His son, Isaac, that God had promised to him. But notice, too, that just as God had told Abraham in chapter 17, verse 11, Abraham circumcises his son. Verse 4, Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old. And, And the writer wants to highlight this very clearly, that this is in obedience to the commands of God. He says there, as God had commanded him. Just as God brought the child into existence by his word, Abraham obeys according to the word of God. When God reveals himself to us by his word, the response then for us is to obey his commands. Turn your attention then to the response of Sarah in light of this divine intervention, this visitation from the Lord. Sarah responds in praise. We see this in verses 6 and 7. There is great rejoicing in 
when the promises of the Lord are fulfilled. And so we think back to chapter 17 and 18, where both Sarah and Abraham laughed at the announcement of the birth of Isaac in, 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 a, in a type of doubting fashion. But here, the laughter that we see in verse 6 is a laughter of joy. Verse 6, Sarah says, God has made laughter for me. Everyone who hears will laugh over me. And so although Sarah and Abraham and and we as the audience will never forget the laughter early in the story, that doubting laughter has now been replaced with joy because God has provided for her just as he said he would. So we see here in these first seven verses, at the appointed time, God fulfills his promises. But the next part of the story takes a unique twist. If you remember last week in chapter 20, we said there was one final threat to the promise, one final threat to Isaac's birth. And so we might think to ourselves, now that he's born, all of the threats will cease. But actually, right away, right after the announcement of the birth, we see that another threat arises. We pick up the story in verse 8, and it says, And the child grew and was weaned. And Abraham made a great feast on the day that Isaac was weaned. But Sarah saw the son of Hagar the Egyptian, whom she had born to Abraham, laughing. So she said to Abraham, cast out this slave woman with her son, for the son of this slave woman shall not be heir with my son Isaac. And the thing was very displeasing to Abraham on account of his son. But God said to Abraham, be not displeased because of the boy and because of your slave woman. Whatever Sarah says to you, do as she tells you, for through Isaac shall your offspring be named. And I will make a nation of the son of the slave woman also, because he is your offspring. So Abraham rose early in the morning and took bread and a skin of water and gave it to Hagar, putting it on her shoulder, along with the child, and sent her away. And she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. When the water and the skin was gone, she put the child under one of the bushes. Then she went and sat down opposite him a good way off and about the distance of a bow shot, for she said, Let me not look on the death of the child. And as she sat opposite him, she lifted up her voice and wept, and God heard the voice of the boy. And the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What troubles you, Hagar? Fear not, for God has heard the voice of the boy where he is. Up, lift up the boy and hold him fast with your hand, for I will make him into a great nation." Then God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water, and she went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. And God was with the boy, and he grew up. He lived in the wilderness and became an expert with the bow. He lived in the wilderness of Paran, and his mother took a wife for him from the land of Egypt. Not only do we see here in the story that it is at the appointed time that God fulfills his promises, here we too also see that threats to God's plan must be removed. Ishmael poses a legitimate threat to Isaac. Ishmael, the son of Hagar, the Egyptian woman from earlier in the story when Sarah and Abraham decide to try and have a son through Hagar, the the Egyptian slave woman. Ishmael goes unnamed here in this part of the story. He's only referred to as the son of Hagar or the son of the slave woman. And on this day, when, when they, uh, Abraham throws a feast because they've weaned Isaac, Sarah recognizes that Ishmael poses a threat to the son of promise. He poses a threat to Isaac. And we see this right away in the ongoing theme of laughter. Verse 9, Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had bore to Abraham, what? Laughing. What is it exactly that Sarah sees here? What exactly does she see that allows her to understand that Ishmael poses a threat to Isaac? Well, we need to do a a little bit of digging here to understand what the word laughing is. This word laughing is actually used several other times in the book of Genesis. One of them we've already considered in chapter 19. You remember Lot goes to his sons-in-laws and he says, Hey, we got to get out of here. The wrath of the Lord is coming. And what what did his sons-in-law say? They said, It seems to us that you are jesting. Or the writer tells us that they saw that that, that their father-in-law seemed to be jesting. This is the same word here of of laughing that we see in verse 9. 
Later in the story, when Isaac uh, takes a a page from his dad's playbook and and puts his wife off as his sister, when the king looks on the situation, the text tells us there that he saw Isaac and his wife playing with one another or laughing with one another, jesting. Later in Genesis 39, when Joseph is in the house of Potiphar and Potiphar's wife tries to sleep with him and he runs away there twice, Potiphar's wife says that Joseph is a mocker of her household. It is, uh, he's a jester in her household. Each time this word is used, in Genesis in particular, it describes some type of misrepresentation of an action. And so at the surface, whatever it was may have seemed harmless, this laughing between Ishmael and, and Isaac, But what is clear from the text is Ishmael posed a serious threat to the child of promise, Isaac, who was the heir. So what we see here is more complicated than just child's play. This is mockery that will lend itself to eventual harm. I think as parents we can maybe relate to this. If your kids are playing in the backyard and maybe some neighborhood kids come over you know, there's a natural type of play between children that can just be kids, you know, being kids and, and maybe a little bit of fighting and bickering. But then there's this one kid who shows up in your backyard. He's a little bit bigger than everybody else. And there's just something about this kid that you know as a parent, he's up to no good. And you can recognize it. And so you say to this kid, hey, you know what? Maybe you should come back another day. And you, you kick him out of, of your yard. That is essentially what we see here. Ishmael poses a threat to the child of promise. Now, interestingly, later in Galatians chapter 4, and we'll go and look at this here in a moment, Paul talks about the incident here, and Paul says that Ishmael was persecuting Isaac. So one commentator said this, Ishmael may have been playing with Isaac, but if he was permitted to continue, his real effort would have been to supplant this new Heir. And so he is posing a legitimate threat to the son of promise. So where in verse 6 we see laughter that is rooted in faith, here in verse 9 we see laughter that is rooted in unbelief, and these two things are incompatible. So what does Sarah do? Sarah has this plan or this request to Abraham to cast out the slave woman with her son. You see that there in verse 10. If you remember earlier in the story when there is the conflict between Sarah and Hagar, Sarah asked Abraham to downgrade Hagar from that of wife to slave woman. And so she asked Abraham to cast out the slave woman with her son. But then notice what Abraham's response is there in verse 11. This was displeasing to him on account of who? His son. The writer here makes it very clear in his own words, in the words of Sarah, to only refer to Ishmael as the son of the slave woman. And if you look at what what Sarah says there in verse uh, 10, she says, cast out this slave woman with who? Her son. For the son of this slave woman shall not be heir with my son Isaac. The conflict then for Abraham is what we see there at the end of verse 11, is that Ishmael is also what? His son. Potentially, this is part of the threat to Isaac, is this conflict of interest for Abraham as he looks on both of his sons. And so what do we do here? Well, the Lord intervenes on their behalf, and what does he say there in verse 12? He says to Abraham, do not be displeased because of the boy. There is a, again, legitimate threat that has been posed to the child. This is a serious crisis that needs resolution, and God intervenes and tells them what to do. God approves of the plan of Sarah to cast out the slave woman with her son. Now, interestingly, again, notice how God refers to Ishmael. God himself here in the story only calls him the boy. He calls him the the, the son of the slave woman woman. And he does this in view of the plan that is to come through the son of prize, the, the son of Isaac, who he names there Isaac, the son of promise. And so if there's a tension that you're feeling here, it is this. It is a tension over sonship. Abraham has these two sons who will be the heir. And God intervenes and he makes it clear that Isaac is the true son of promise. 
And so Abraham obeys the Lord, and he, he, he casts out the slave woman with her, her child. Now, when you read this, just as a casual reader, verse 14, what you see there, you, you, you might say to yourself, this is cruel. He just gives her some bread and water and sends her off into the wilderness, and God approved of this? How can this be? This, this seems like a cruel thing that happens here. Well, a few things that we need to consider to help us understand not only what we see in the casting out, but the importance of what is at stake here in the story. First, God has already affirmed that he will make a great nation out of the son of the slave woman. God has already promised that he is going to guard and protect Ishmael. Verse 13, I will make a nation of the son of the slave woman. Later in the story, when Sarah is in, or Hagar is in crisis in the wilderness, there in verse 18, he reaffirms this to her where he says, I will make him into a great nation. And this should sound quite familiar to us because the last time Hagar found herself in the wilderness when she was fleeing from Sarah and God comes and intervenes on her behalf, there he said to her, I will surely multiply your offspring so that they cannot be numbered for multitude. God promises that he is going to deliver Ishmael and make him into a great nation. Important for us to consider that. Something else we see here is at the end uh, of, of what Abraham does. He takes the bread and the skin of water. He puts it on her shoulders along with the child. And look at the words that the writer uses there. It says, he sent her away. This is in stark contrast to what we saw earlier in chapter 16 when the, the, the conflict arises between Sarah and Hagar. And what does Hagar do? She flees into the wilderness because of what? Sarah had been harsh to her. So we see here a, a, a sense of compassion in the way that she is sent out. She's not fleeing for her life this time. But most importantly, we see this. God heard the voice of the boy. Hagar finds herself in the wilderness. She runs out of food and water. The child is about to die, so she puts him there uh, under this bush, and she removes herself in, to a far distance because she doesn't want to see the death of her child. And yet, what does it say? Verse 17, God heard the voice of the boy. God has heard the voice of the boy where he is, the angel of the Lord said to her there. Finally, in verse 9, it says, Then God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. Verse 20, God was with the boy. God protected and provided for the outcast. God had not abandoned Ishmael in this casting out. What is happening here is God is protecting the promise. He is guarding the son of promise from this threat. God will protect his covenant. His ways will not be thwarted. And so these theological truths that we see here in the, in, in the telling of this story are, are here for us plainly to see in the text. But the final question we need to ask ourselves today is how do we apply this to our lives? How do we apply this unique and, and somewhat strange story that we see here in Genesis chapter 21 to our lives in the New Testament? Well, luckily for us, Paul helps us with this in the New Testament. So if you turn with me to Galatians. Galatians chapter 3 and chapter 4. We're going to look at several verses here in these two chapters as we look to apply the story to our lives this morning. Some of these verses are verses that we've already read together in our study of Abraham. But I want us to consider what we see here in Galatians, this New Testament epistle that Paul writes in light of the story that we just read. Uh, let's begin in chapter 3, verse 7. This is one we've read before. It says, Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, if you shall, if you shall, In you shall all the nations be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed, along with Abraham, the man of faith. Jump down to verse 16. It says, Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say, and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, and to your offspring, who is Christ. And so in the context of Genesis, Isaac is most certainly the one of promise. But through a New Testament lens, we affirm that Jesus is the one 
He is the promised seed that is to come from Abraham and bless the nations. Look over then to verse 23 of Galatians chapter 3. Paul says, Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came, in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many as you, as were baptized into Christ, have put on Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are in Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. We continue there in chapter 4, verse 1. I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave, though he is the owner of everything. But he is under guardians and managers until the date is set by his father. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. Now just pause there for a moment. Notice the theme here that we're reading of sonship versus slavery. Don't miss this. Verse 4 continues. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the Spirit of his Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father, so you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Look over then at chapter 4, verse 21. As Paul begins to apply this to our lives, there in verse 21 he says, Tell me, You who desire to be under the law, do you not listen to the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman and one by a free woman. But the son of the slave was born according to the flesh, while the son of the free woman was born through promise. Now this may be interpreted allegorically. Now pause for a moment. Another good hermeneutical lesson for us here. When we read the Old Testament, we need to be careful not to over-spiritualize the stories of the Old Testament. And so some of the early church fathers would interpret the Old Testament allegorically. And they would, they would find Jesus everywhere in the Old Testament that he wasn't necessarily there. But when we come to the New Testament through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and the New Testament writers tell us to interpret something in the Old Testament allegorically, guess what? We should do that. So what does he say there in verse 24? We can take from this story. These women are two covenants. One is from Mount Sinai bearing children for slavery. She is Hagar. Now Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. She corresponds to present Jerusalem for she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free and she is our mother. For it is written, Rejoice, O barren one who does not bear. Break forth and cry aloud, you who are not in labor. For the children of the desolate one will be more than those of the one who has a husband. Now you, brothers, like Isaac, are children of promise. That is for you, brother and sister. Hear that again. Verse 28. Now you, brothers, like Isaac, are children of promise. But just as at that time, he who was born according to the flesh persecuted him who was born according to the Spirit. So there it is. Ishmael persecuted Isaac. So also it is now. Verse 30. But what does the scripture say? Here Paul paraphrases Sarah's words. Cast out the slave woman and her son. For the son of the slave woman shall not inherit with the son of the free woman. So brothers... You are not children of the slave, but of the free. Don't miss that. This is crucial to how we understand the story. Galatians chapter 3 verse 16 affirms this. Christ is the seed. The seed that was promised to Eve in the garden. The seed that is promised to Abraham. He is the seed. And the law of the Old Testament points us and brings us to Christ, according to chapter 3, verse 24. And chapter 3, verse 29 tells us this, that in Christ we are all sons of the promise, heirs with Christ. And so when Christ comes and the promise is fulfilled, When he brings redemption for the world by the blood of his cross and resurrection from the grave, the old order is done away with. Therefore, as children of the promise, 
We are like Isaac, according to chapter 4, verse 28. And there in chapter 4, verse 30, we see that we must get rid of the son of the slave woman. Dear Christian, to live as the slave, to live as the old self, to live as a child of the slave woman is to deny the promise that is fulfilled in Christ and to live simply in the flesh. As children of the promise, we are free from the bondage of the law. We are free from the bondage of the mother of the slave, the the, the child. And we are free from the bondage of sin and death. And so we must cast out the things of the flesh. The old self that looked to threaten the freedom that we have in Christ. So we continue there in Galatians chapter 5 verse 1. Where Paul says this, For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. If you are in Christ today, you have been set free from sin and death. Live as such. Live in freedom to Christ. Do not submit again to the ways of the former self. One final verse I want us to consider here, Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. Paul tells us what we are to do then. If we are to live in freedom in Christ and not submit again to the yoke of slavery, what what does that look like? Verse 16, he tells us this, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh, for these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. Verse 18, but if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under law. What does it mean to walk in the Spirit? Well, we see here clearly in verse 16 what it, what it doesn't mean. Walking in the Spirit doesn't mean gratifying the desires of the, pl- the flesh, as Paul says there in verse 16. The flesh is the old self, the one who is in bondage to the slave woman. And so when we are gratifying the desires of the flesh, we are not walking in the spirit. Rather, we are setting our mind on earthly things, fame and fortune and and worldly pleasure. And the text makes it clear that these things are at odds with walking in the spirit. So what does it mean then to walk in the spirit? We walk in the spirit when our desires from the spirit are stronger than our desires from the flesh. So hear this. As we obey the command of Paul here in verse 16 to walk by the spirit, we must understand this. It is not something that we can do in and of ourselves. Rather, it is an outworking of the spirit of God In us, the Holy Spirit that resides in us as believers is what enables us to walk in the Spirit. Anything that is good in us is all of God and His Spirit that is in us. So how then do we obey a command? Paul very clearly says there in verse 16, walk by the Spirit. We have this charge to be about this. So what does that look like? I want to close with this. This is an acrostic that I heard uh, a dear pastor share many years ago that I've held on to. Um, in fact, I, I have this prayer uh, in my preaching journal, and, and every time before I get up to preach, I pray through this acronym. It's five letters, A-P-T-A-T. If you're taking notes and you want to write this down, feel free. There's, there's nothing magical about this, but I think that this gets to the heart of what it means to walk in the Spirit. You, you could call this aptat, if you will, A-P-T-A-T. What, what do we have here? First is A. We must acknowledge the very thing that we just talked about. Apart from God's Spirit, we can do no good. If there's anything good in us this morning, it is all of Christ and His Spirit that resides in us. There's nothing good that comes from us. It is all by the Spirit of God alone. And we must acknowledge this daily, moment by moment, when pride threatens to creep into our lives to realize that if there's anything good in us, it is Christ. So we must acknowledge that. But then secondly, we need to pee. We need to pray for God to give us spirit-filled 
desires. Pray that God would give you a hatred for the sin that so easily entangles you. And as he he talked about there in verse 17, the things that we want to do, pray that God by his spirit would give you a divine hatred of sin. A divine desire to flee from sin and to kill sin. Pray that God would give you a love for his word and a passion for his word. Sometimes as we read through the word of God in our daily devotion, we find ourselves in season where, seasons where we feel dry and we feel like the word isn't speaking to us and we feel like we don't understand what we see there. Pray and ask the spirit of God to illuminate the word to us and to transform us. Pray that we would love obedience to Jesus. Pray that obedience to Jesus would not be a burden to you. Pray that obedience to your master would not be burdensome, but rather it would be joy-filled and that the Spirit of God would enable us to walk in obedience to our master. Pray for God to give us spirit-filled desires. The next letter there, T, we must trust in the promises of God. We talked about this last week. Trusting that he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. Trust that God will accomplish his will in your life. He will sanctify you if you are his. He will keep you to the end if you are his. Rest and trust in the promises of scripture. And then four, the next A, A A-P-T-A, is act. We need to act. We need to walk in obedience to the commands of Christ. The commands of Christ, the commands in Scripture are not suggestions. They're commands. And we as the people of God are expected to obey them. And so this is very practical for me as I I pray through this every time before I come up to preach. When I get to act That action of obedience simply looks like this, getting out of that pew and walking up here and standing behind the sacred desk. Because before this moment happens, I want to run out of this building as fast as I can. Why on earth has God called me to stand in front of you and bring the word? And so the action of obedience sometimes is simply putting one foot in step in front of the other. Getting off the couch and coming to church Starting that conversation of getting to the gospel with your neighbor or your coworker, Act in obedience to Christ. And then finally, the final T is we need to thank God for any virtue or good deed that is in us. That comes by his spirit alone. Any good that you have in yourself, any good that you find in your family, anything good that we have together as a church We must thank God alone for those things because he alone is the one who gives us these good gifts. All that we have, anything that is good in us comes by his spirit alone that has indwelt us when we come to faith in Christ and we must thank him for that. So acknowledge that we can do nothing apart from God. Pray for God to give us spirit-filled desires. Trust in the promises of God. Act in obedience to Christ as master. And finally, thank God for the good deeds and virtues that he has placed in our lives by his grace. Christian, you are a son of the free woman. The language there of son obviously is speaking just to the male, but that's purposefully the the, the right as an heir to the throne. We are heirs with Christ. Each of us are sons of the free woman today by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. The call of scripture is this, cast out the slave woman. Get rid of the old self. Kill sin and pursue freedom in Christ all of your days. Walk in the spirit, church. Let's pray.